Let's open our Bibles this morning to the Gospel of John. John chapter 5, we'll read just one verse. One verse, one declaration of Jesus as He walked on earth. We'll read this verse and it'll be the basis for us to launch into um, this maybe two-part series that we have entitled... When the dead hear the voice of God. When the dead hear the voice of God. John chapter 5, verse 25. Jesus says, Most assuredly I say to you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, And those who hear will live. Let me read that again. That's a wonderful uh, declaration of Christ. Most assuredly I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Amen. As we celebrate resurrection, we must be reminded That our Lord lived, died, and rose to give life to dead sinners. Resurrection is about God giving life to dead sinners. Oh, obviously it's about the resurrection of the Lord. But He resurrected, He lived, He died, and He rose so that He could give life to the dead. And Jesus, when he was walking on earth, said, the hour is coming and now is. Interesting, it's not at the end of the age. At the end of the age, we will rise and we will receive immortal bodies to enter into the eternal kingdom. But in order to rise at the end of the age, you must rise now. In order for the dead to rise at the end of the age and inherit the blessedness of the eternal kingdom that has now dawned upon us, you must be raised now. You must be raised now. You must experience this resurrection that Jesus Christ is talking about. You must be raised from the dead. The Bible describes men without God as dead. Ever since men sinned in the Garden of Eden, death has been the state of humanity. Ever since the Garden, ever since the fall, the condition of humankind is one of death. That's why Jesus says, the time is coming and now is when the living The half dead, the almost dead, but not quite dead. The dead will hear. Jesus makes reference to the condition of man. It's a reference to the state of man ever since the fall. Men sinned, men fell away from life, and man has been dead ever since. That's why when we are born, we begin to die. You ever thought about that? That as we are born, we begin to die. Our bodies are in that constant state of what? Of growing, of growing, of changes. But it's a change that reaches a peak. And then at some point it does what? It begins to dwindle down. It cannot keep, it cannot contain, it cannot stay on that course of life. Physically, we're dying. We're dying physically. Why? The result of our sin. The consequence of sin. That's why people die. Make no mistake about it. That's why people physically die. Every time we're confronted with a death, you must be reminded of the fall. It's God's way of reminding this world, you are fallen creatures. That's your condition. It's a great humiliation for men. 
right? I received the remains of my mom um, some time ago after she was incinerated. Um, and when they gave me that little box in my hand, and I worked up the courage to open it up and look inside. And I saw there some, some dust, maybe some pebbles. It was all dust. It was all dust. We die. We die. Life is short. Life is vain. Under the sun, it's useless. If we don't have God, if we do not have the source of life, if we do not have hope about getting past that dust, life is useless. We die. That dust speaks to us of the condition of man since the fall. This body that we keep, that we treasure, that we go to the gym so they can stay in some kind of shape, even though the years now begin to resist that shape. <laughs> I'm going to come and find that out. <laughs> Man, it used to be so easy for me, you know. Now I feel my body so sluggish. I just went over 40. I'm going to be 42 this year. <laughs> and I'm beginning the sluggishness of my body is beginning to say, hey, you can't do what you used to do. No, I'm dying. David, you're dying, David. Your body's dying. Mm -hmm. Oh, we live in a culture that does not want to face up to that reality, does it? <laughs> we live in a culture of denial. We live in a culture that to the end of the day wants to pretend that they are alive. They want to pretend they are alive by the makeup they wear, by how they prop up their body, by the things they do, by the works they engage in. They want to scream out, we are alive. But Jesus says, the hour is coming when the dead will hear the voice of God. Physical death, moral and spiritual death. What is to be said of moral and spiritual death? In the same way that we see that physical death and physical decay. We also see the spiritual and the moral decay of man. Do we not? Yes, we do. Only God can bring dead sinners back to life. That's what we proclaim. That's the gospel. The gospel is not a patch-up job of you made some mistakes, but God just knows your heart, and you just, just need to try to live a better life. That's not the gospel. That's the gospel that resounds today from mighty pulpits in the flesh. But it's the voice of Antichrist where are the prophets of today? There are prophetic voices today. I wonder if you have ears to hear it. Your life depends on it. Those that hear it, blessed are they that hear the words of God. Blessed are they that hear, that has ears to hear the prophetic voice of God. To discern it, to distinguish it, to say, I see the message of God. That is the message that gives me life. I hear it. Only God can bring dead sinners back to life. However, rebellious, sinful men tries to raise themselves back to their own sense of life. Isn't it? Isn't that the condition? Rebellious man is trying to raise themselves back to... Isn't that what Adam and Eve did? The minute they sinned, they were dead. However, they decided to raise themselves back to life. How did they do it? They ran away from God. They hid. And they created from themselves a way of fixing their problem. They had a problem. They understood that. People know humanity has a problem. Everybody, everybody knows that. 
But the problem is if they know and understand and discern what the problem is about at its core and how that problem can be fixed. And Adam and Eve thought that the problem was only a problem that was psychological. We feel shame. How can we fix that? Well, let's go to the therapist. Uh, we, we, we're, we're naked. How can, we, how can we provide for our needs? Well, let's just produce some uh, work of our own. We could do it. Yes, we can. <laughs> that is so emblematic of, of humanism. Without me, you can do nothing. Oh, that God would raise a voice even for the nation that could be respected. Left and right, Democrats and Republicans alike. Not many voices in the last few years can be respected. Can they? No. No. They don't bring the wisdom of God. They, they don't bring the knowledge of God into the public arena where, where it also needs to sound. <clears throat> The reality of God. The reality that God is in the midst of every area of our lives. The reality of man's condition. The reality of how God's wisdom will speak to the political realm. How God's wisdom will speak to education. How God's wisdom will speak to economic matters. How God's wisdom will speak to family matters. To spiritual matters. You think those realms need to be separated from the wisdom of God? No. That's why we are in the condition that we're in. They cannot be separated. They need to be addressed with wisdom, with discernment. But man is dead, and we bring that death into every endeavor of human life. Every endeavor of human life doesn't matter how hard men tries to raise themselves. It's characterized by death. They call, this man, this dead man calls their own life-giving ways with a variety of names. They call them humanitarian. We are humanitarians, right? We are spiritual. Oprah Winfrey talks about what? Uh, spirituality, the rock stars and the movie stars from Hollywood, they are very spiritual and they are very humanitarian, religious, even Christian. Let me tell you, apostasy has been with us since the turn of last century. I don't know how many of you are reading history. And are being able to follow the track and the line of what's been happening in society. Uh, I would encourage reading J. Gresson Machen. J. Gresson Machen was a scholar theologian in, in Princeton Seminary at the turn of the 20th century. When the Princeton Seminary and its leading board decided to sign the Auburn Declaration in which they denied the virginal birth, in which some of the fundamental tenets of Scripture were denied as essential for the ministry and for the pastorate. Unheard of in the 19th century. Princeton had been that, that, that really amazing institution that produced the likes of the Hodge brothers and Warfield and Machen himself. Men that loved the gospel and believed it. They believed the Bible. Is that too much to ask? They were not sophisticated, contemporary, modern men. They believed the word of God. Apostasy is among us. Antichrist is among us. When that institution turned, it was a sign of the times. 
And, and then we had just the avalanche of apostasy that unraveled the major mainstream American religious institutions and denominations as we see it almost having taken full shape today. Orthodox Lutheranism split, Presbyterianism split, Anglicanism split, major seminaries falling by the wayside. All of these, all of these universities, remember Harvard? You know Harvard, right? Harvard, Princeton, all of these major schools, what do they used to do? They used to teach the gospel. Did you know that? Did you know that's how they got founded and started? They were, they were centers of gospel distribution. They were centers of biblical scholarly work. Scholarly work. Reading and understanding the original languages of the word. And equipping men so that they could know the Bible. Be experts in the Bible. And go out and reach the world for Christ. Something happened in the 20th century. Apostasy came around. And then, and then the mission changed. And the mission became one of humanitarian work. Doctrine? No, that's, that's too antiquated. That, that, that's, that's just for people that, that are really not sophisticated. Not really scholarly. Not really understanding how things have changed. J. Gresham Machen sounded a great voice of alarm. And he rose. And in 1928 he departed from Princeton Theological Seminary. And founded Westminster Theological Seminary. And I've been reading this man's courageous and, and bold stands during that day. And he stood. And another... And another institution was created, Westminster. That's a sound institution today. Where the gospel is still believed. Where men and, men and women are still equipped to do God's work among God's people. <clears throat> the voices are not many today, but there are voices that are rising up. And J. Great Gresham Manchin as a visionary believed that a new revival was going to come because revival comes during times of controversy. Controversial times are times of great opportunity. Great opportunity where error can be unveiled, can be exposed, can be corrected, and a call back to the true gospel and to truth is then set forth for other generations to, to follow. Hear me out. Who likes controversy? Do we? We don't like controversy. We don't like to be embroiled in, 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 in let alone doctrinal. See, see, that's the problem today. But say, what are you bickering about? Doctrine? Come on, people are dying. Let's go out and feed them. Let's go out and, and engage in humanitarian work. Let's go out and see, folks, none of that matters if the dead do not hear the voice of God. None of that matters. No, we have a subtle enemy. We have a smart enemy. And he uses the dead to entertain them, to distract them, and to... Get them away from hearing the gospel, the voice of God, through men's life, quote-unquote, life-giving ways. What are these ways? Humanitarian, spiritual, religious, and even Christian. But in reality, they scorn and reject God's sovereign way of raising the dead back to life, namely the gospel. They scorn that. How do you know Antichrist, the spirit of Antichrist? They scorn and reject God's sovereign ways of raising the dead back to life, the gospel of Christ. That's the spirit of Antichrist. That's the spirit of apostasy. That's the spirit that we must detect 
fight against, contend against, contend for the faith once given to the saints. We live in a time when God may be calling men and women to rise that will be bold, that will not be afraid of controversy, in a time where tolerance is a virtue, that will be willing to stand and be intolerant of the spirit of Antichrist. And will be intolerant of the timidity and the shyness and the cowardice to not stand for the gospel. These are those times. These are the end of times. Are we going to be, I know it's just a handful of us here. It only took 12 with Christ. And I'm praying that God will give us uh, will sound that, that alarm in our hearts and at the same time that great earnest expectation that Jesus is almost here with the kingdom. The kingdom is among us, but the consummation of all things is about to break forth, that everything is lined up, and that a generation is going to rise up to sound a clear message in these end times and give a clear witness of the gospel before he returns. So that the last of his sheep may come into the fold. For God is not willing that any should perish. But that all should come to repentance. And none of his sheep will perish. We're going to bring them. <laughs> Praise God. We're going to bring them. Who wants to bring them with me? I will make you fishers of men. Jesus said. That is the great commission. That is God's sovereign way of raising the dead back to life. Fishers of men. We cannot give up that enterprise. But the world and the Welsh church, the apostasy is among us. The Welsh church, the desecration of the temple, in my humble opinion, the desecration of the temple is not going to be a Jewish temple. The desecration of the temple is happening. I believe in my humble opinion. And the desecration of the temple, I think is the desecration of the church. And it's happening. It's the apostasy. Oh, I remember a certain movie of old. Here's the plot of this movie of old. Some men, and it's kind of fuzzy, I'm going to have to view that movie again. I used to like this movie when I was a kid. Man, every time I heard this movie was going to play, I, I was so fascinated and intrigued by it. And in a certain movie of all, some men bring another man back to life. Isn't that a great plot? And this movie is old. Today we have all kinds of freakish movies, right? So that the audiences just are, are clamoring for more and more of a shock value, right? But back of old, this just idea of some men raising another man back to life was just unheard of. And, and it was amazing. It was something to watch. What's going to happen with this man? Some men bring another man back to life. But the consequence, the end product is a freak monster called Frankenstein. Maybe you remember that movie. I, I love that movie. You still love that movie. Did you too? Did you like it too? <laughs> yeah. I close my eyes and I see this huge bulk of a, of a man with these things in his, the size of his temples. You know, walking out and hardly making any, making any words. And he was alive. <laughs> they brought him back to life. Men bringing another man back to life. Yet what they got was a monster. It's Frankenstein. Men's attempts to raise themselves through science, education, prosperity, spirituality, and religion without the true power of the gospel of Christ have only resulted in self-serving, self-willed, self-righteous, and self-deceiving Frankenstein demons. We we'll live in a society of Frankensteins, spiritually speaking. We live in a demonic-filled society. I don't know if you can sense it. 
don't know if you can see it, but who can see? Only those that have eyes to see it. Men has raised themselves back to life. They don't need God. At least they don't need, well, they talk about God. Because that's going to be the false prophet. The false prophet is among us. It's in the apostasy that is happening. They have not forsaken the church, have they? They just have split from the churches that have remained true to the gospel. And they keep on mentioning Jesus. <laughs> they keep on mentioning Christ. But it is a Christ that we would not recognize. It's the, historic, it's the quest to find the historic Christ. The cries of no miracles. The cries that was only a powerful teacher and prophet of God. The cries that came to show us a better way. The cries that came to give us an example on how to live life. And if we just follow that example and become better men and women in this world, following the example of the teacher, the world will become a better place and God will be happy with us. That's false Christianity. That's apostasy Christianity. Jesus Christ claimed to be the Messiah, the Son of God, the one that came to give his life for the sheep. I have the power to take to give it, to lay it down, and I have the power to take it back, back up again. I am the resurrection and the life. <laughs> Jesus called out. Before Abraham was, I am. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to God but through me. But these demons are luring many from the way of life. It's a, see, it's, a, it's a spiritual battle. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers in the heavenly realms. It's a battle for your mind because it's your mind is what you believe. Your mind is, it has to do with your spirit. Your spirit. The Bible says in Proverbs 16, 25, there's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. There's a way, all right, that seems right to a man. Oh, yeah. I don't think that way is right. I think this way is right. How do you know that? How do you know, a Pastor? Well, I just trust the Bible. And there's many people interpreting the Bible. Let us reason together. And just come and reason together and study together. Don't just close the Bible because there are many interpretations. Don't just go with the one you feel better or more comfortable with because it could lead to death. Make sure that you examine the claims. The claims that we're making. The claims that I am making from this pulpit are claims that are historical. The claims that I am making are claims that go back to the Reformation. The claims that I am making are the claims that Martin Luther made. There were claims made before him by John Wycliffe in England. There were claims made by John Huss in Poland. There were claims made by different people throughout history that taught the gospel in the darkness of the Middle Ages against the Romanism, the darkness of Roman Catholicism. The claims that we make from this pulpit are antithetical, irreconcilable with Roman Catholicism. Hear me out. Irreconcilable. Either Roman Catholicism is Antichrist or we are. You take a stand, where are you going to be? These are times of decision. You have to decide. You have to examine Roman Catholicism's claims and then come and examine the Reformed faith claims. But, but examine them, study them, ask which one accords with Scripture. I tell you, they're irreconcilable. They're mutually exclusive. <clears throat> when we preach the truth, the truth divides. Oh, why do you have to be so divisive? Because it's a matter of life and death. It's a matter of life and death. It's a matter of either I'm just going to let 
Frankenstein's live. Listen what it's about. It's a matter of whether we're going to let Frankenstein's live. It's a matter of whether we're going to have a Frankensteinish church. Or if we are going to expose the Frankensteins and call them for what they are. That's what is at stake. And that will divide people. But you know in whose tradition we stand? In the tradition of the preacher of Nazareth. Who said, I did not come to bring peace. I came to bring... What did Jesus say? The sword. Why is Jesus so mean? Why does he have to be so mean and say that? That must not be the historical Jesus, some would say. <laughs> because Jesus knew... That when he spoke the truth of the kingdom, families were going to be torn apart. Some families would not accept Jesus' teachings. Some families would not accept in John chapter 6, what Jesus said, No man can come to me. No man can come to me. Here is the difference between these two systems. Why do I mention Roman Catholicism and Protestantism? Because these are the two sides within the Christian umbrella. Hear me out, church. Hear me out. The two, the two Christian currents under what is called the Christian umbrella is Roman Catholicism... And put in that as well Greek Orthodox and all that, okay? And the Protestant view. Because see, the rest, the rest we can pretty much pick out, right? We know that Muhammad, you know, Islam, who was Muhammad? Come on. I mean, we know that Confucianism and Buddha, you know, all of that we can immediately what? Set aside. I hope. I hope you're there. I hope you can see that. Now, the, the, the big question is under the so-called Christian umbrella, where is the truth? And I want to tell you that the teachings of Jesus creates a divide. And the teachings of Jesus creates a divide between the Roman Catholic view and the Protestant view. Jesus said in John chapter 6, No man can come to me unless the Father brings them. And I shall raise them at the last day. No man can come to me. You have no life of your own, Jesus was saying. The time is coming when the dead shall hear the voice of God. Listen to what Jesus says also in John 5. Verse 21. John 5 verse 21. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom? He will. That's what we believe. We believe man is dead. Roman Catholicism throughout history said man is not dead. Man can contribute to, and help and cooperate with the grace of God. Did you know that was Roman Catholic doctrine? Yet, that has spilled over into where? Into evangelical churches. It has spilled over into our churches, corrupting the true gospel, creating Frankenstein monsters, even among our denominations, even in the Baptist church. I give life to whom I will. I give life to the dead. I bring them. The Father brings them unto me. Notice what Jesus said in John 6. In John 6. 
John 6, verse 37. John 6, verse 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me. All that the Father gives me will come to me. That's our view. That's our view. Roman Catholic doctrine throughout history has said, Oh, many will not come. And they will frustrate on their free will the plan of God. You need to decide. You need to examine these two claims. Because your life depends on it. Your life depends on it. Either you go with a Frankensteinish Christianity, or you come to the gospel of Christ. The divisive, discriminating, sword-wielding, separating, narrow door, stray gate, Jesus only, His righteousness alone, by faith alone, by grace alone, by the sacrifice of Christ alone, type of Christianity. This one, the latter that I just mentioned, is the Protestant way and was the cause of the Reformation and is the vision of our church. It is my prayer. It is my prayer. And I know I cannot, I can only pray. That's all I can do. That's all I can do. It is my prayer that you will not be offended at the teachings of Jesus. You know what Jesus said? You know what the gospel says? That Jesus was placed and had been put for the raising and the falling of many. Did you know that? Many will rise on this stone, but many will also what? Break on this stone. It is my prayer. Those that are offended at this teaching are breaking and shattering on the rock of the ages. It is my prayer and my plea that with God's Holy Spirit, you will rise on God's eternal, ageless stone. And that is the Lamb of God made flesh and His ministry for us. It is my prayer that in this season, we will slay the Frankenstein monsters of the age with a very clear teaching of the gospel of Christ. That's our mission for the season. Let us pray the gospel. Let us preach the gospel of Christ. Let us be assured that if we are faithful to our commission, if we are faithful to this commission, God will raise the dead and bring them back to life. Let us express to the world that we know God's love. This is a mission of love. The love, where, what do you talk, what do you mean love? Isn't a humanitarian mission a mission of love? Let me tell you where love is shown. For God demonstrates his love for us that while we were yet sinners, Frankenstein monsters, Jesus died for us. Jesus loves you. Stop telling people Jesus loves them. Preach the gospel. There is not one instance in the word of God where you hear the apostles telling the crowds, Jesus loves you. Not once. That's not the way they preach the gospel. Oh, did they talk about God love? Absolutely. How? The cross. (laughs) The cross that Frankenstein hates. The cross that men have deserted. In order to say, we are so loving and Jesus loves you. When was the last time somebody convinced you that somebody else loved you? Huh? If I come now and I say to you, Carlos, Carlos, man, that woman really loves you. Get out of here. She, she loves me? Okay. Well, if you say so. Well, what does that mean to somebody to come and have another man say to them, so and so loves you? I'm telling you, she loves you. 
Man, the Beatles were obsessed with that, right? She loves you, yeah. Well, how did that song go? Yeah, yeah, yeah. With a love like that, you know you should be glad. They were trying to convince you that somebody loved you. But at the end of, at the end of time, it is up to the person to know themselves what? Loved. You cannot convince someone else of somebody else's love, can you? That person must be convinced from where? From inward witness and testimony. That's how somebody's convinced about love. And that is the gospel. The gospel calls people to look at the cross and there see God's love for sinners. Did, that, did, that, did he do that for me? Do you believe that? Yes, then he did it. Does he love me? Do you see him precious? Yes, he loves you. But it's not because of my word, it's because of what? It's because of the witness of the cross. That he did for love. Whoever he did that for, he did for love. For love he became incarnate. For love he lived a perfect life. For love he bled and died. For love he rose for his people. That's what we need to proclaim. Stop trying to convince people that God loves them. God can do that. God can convince them if you're faithful to the gospel. They're not going to come to Christ if you convince them that Christ loves them. Oh, great. I love myself too. Ah, somebody else loves me. No wonder. I thought I was such a lovable person. Of course God loves me. Ha! I am all that. No, 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 child. No, people. We're sinners. We stood under the wrath of God. The Bible says that God hates the wicked, is angry with them all day long. But if those sinners can look to the cross and at the cross <laughs> see the light, and at the cross hear the loving words, and at the cross hear themselves loved by the word of the gospel, alas. They have come from death unto life. And now they know themselves loved. And you try to tell them that God doesn't love them. <laughs> and they're going to say, you're lying. <laughs> I know he loves me. He proved it over and over at Calvary. I know he loves me. <laughs> I know that. No demon of this world can come and say that God does not love me when a person has been won by the gospel. Frankenstein's today sharing God's love. Don't be deceived. Come to the cross. Come to the cross without a plea. Come to him by faith. And it is my prayer that you will find there life eternal, resurrecting life, springs of living water that will up within you unto eternal life. Father, we thank you. Thank you for the gospel and help us this season again to treasure it, to savor it, to delight in it, and do not be afraid of proclaiming it truthfully boldly and clearly because it is in that gospel that we live we give you all the honor the glory and the praise and the people of God said amen and amen God bless you